Aren't you grateful that this has, this is a church that ministers to people in this building. It's a church that ministers to people in this city and in this state and in this country and in this world. So it's not just one or the other, it's both and. Can I hear a good amen? And we are so excited because we are a part of this incredible, incredible organization called Missions Me. We've gone to a few different countries that we have had some incredible transformation with. And this year is actually in America, ladies and gentlemen, in Los Angeles. And let me just tell you, because of your generosity and because your willingness to go, you've made a difference in so many people's lives. So just last year, uh, this, this church gave $100,000 to make this event possible. We're joining together with so many other churches, so many other. It's not, and here's what I love. One church doesn't get the glory. The capital C church gets the credit, but Jesus gets all the glory. <clears throat> and we work together. So today, we're in for a treat. And matter of fact, my wife and I, we're on vacation right now. Uh, we normally take a sabbatical, like, like I said, but I had to come and hear one of my closest friends preach tonight. And also... Uh, my daughter, Hadassah, who's the worship leader, it's her birthday today. Ladies and gentlemen, happy birthday. She is an incredible leader, an incredible, not just worshiper, an incredible Christ follower. And I love you with all of my heart. Mom and I are so proud, your sisters, and uh, we're so great. I'm talking to her like she's sitting right here. I have no idea where she is. She's behind, yeah, she's behind stage. Just kind of, wasn't that worship amazing? Gosh. Had all four Nepstad girls up there today. I was fun. I'm so proud, but I'm so thankful that it's not just our four daughters. Um, it's you. You're making a difference. Everybody in small groups, in growth track, in dream team. And first Wednesdays are very, very special to me. They have a special place in my heart because I feel like God does some stuff on first Wednesdays that you don't get on a Sunday. And tonight, how many are excited for the word of God? Come on, are you really excited? Are you going to amen the preacher? Oh, come on, listen, you can pull better things out of a preacher than he even thought he had in him when you respond with faith, amen, you're taking notes, you're paying attention, and God's going to give us some downloads tonight I think is going to change your life. Do me a favor, everybody. Can we stand to our feet? Jedediah Thurner is one of my closest friends. He's on the lead team of Missions Me. He's an incredible speaker, an incredible orator, but ladies and gentlemen, he's here tonight to preach. Can you clap your hands? And let's welcome Pastor Jedediah Thurner, everybody. Hey, can we put our hands together for Jesus? Come on, I know we've been worshiping. Come on, but if you got a reason to be grateful, if you got a reason to be thankful, come on, if God's done something good in your life, let's just go ahead and take a praise break for a moment. Come on, let's just continue to set the atmosphere of expectation. Even you watching online, go ahead and just take a moment to let God know one more time how good he is, how great he is, how gracious he is. Come on, you're not worshiping a man. We're worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords the undefeated reigning champion of humanity. Come on, Fellowship Church. Man, you guys are going to mess things up with what God's doing in this place tonight. You guys look so good, and uh, that's a great moment for you to say amen. amen. You're like looking at your husband being like, he's talking about me, babe. You, said, you heard that, right? That's why I spent the extra minutes. That's why we're late, okay? It was, I was trying to look good, but you guys look good tonight. Such an honor to be here. Why don't you hug two to three people if you're comfortable with or COVID pounds or, you know, whatever's protocol. But it is, uh, man, such a privilege to be with you guys and so honored to be here for Hadassah's birthday. That's why I flew in 22. And, uh, man, how epic is it is to see a family loving Jesus together. I don't know about you, but when I see the Nepstead family, um, I saw the girls up here tonight, and I'm like, that's what I want. I got four kids, too, and, and, and I don't, they need a lot of prayer right now. They're, it's an interesting, <laughs> we're, in, we're in an interesting spot. Anything could happen, you know, so this is what I, I, I want our family, literally want our family to aspire to be, and um, Man, I just love you guys so much. If you're like, why is this guy weird and emotional right now? It's because I haven't seen you for a minute. 
You know, I haven't been here, I think, since 2019 or the first year of 2020. I didn't do good the last time, so it was like, hmm, you know, it's like a long break, but, you know, after COVID, you get desperate for speakers. Like, hey, I know you, um, no, but for, for those of you who were here in, I believe, 2014 is the first time I visited a, a community center with three services 1,200 people, and uh, saw what God was doing, met this incredible couple, fell in love with them. They are literally some of our best friends in the world, and have now watched us. For those of you who are just entering in, watching it online, maybe you just started coming post-COVID, needed some hope and some help, and, and, and started coming. You need to know you've been drafted into a really divine narrative, this incredible masterpiece that God's been drafting, and, and you're in the center of the story. And it started with a family that laid it all down to, to build a community of people uh, that would impact the world, as you heard tonight, not just impact a community or impact cities, but impact the entire world. And that grew from a few services to more services and, and then into this location. And we've had the incredible partnership and privilege of having a covenant relationship where you guys need to know, it was already said, but you guys have been a part of national transformation well, you guys have been a part of millions, not just a couple hundred thousand, millions of people hearing about Jesus. You guys have been a part of hundreds of thousands of people getting life-saving aid. You guys have been a part of bringing hope and help and healing to communities and to pastors and to leaders all around the world, and you guys are still doing it, which is... Can we honor your leaders for a moment, just Pastor Sean and Diana and just the entire team and staff for who they are and how they love and how they lead and we honor you and we celebrate you. And thank you for who you are. Thank you for changing my life. Thank you for being a friend that asked me the very tough, awkward questions and I'm gonna be a better husband because of it. Come on, can we give it up for your leaders one more time? We love you guys. We love you guys. We love you guys. And uh, thank you. I just wanna thank you on behalf of myself, Dominic, uh, the entire executive team, Missions Not Me, which you guys have been a part of. Thank you for standing with us all these years and now standing with us in America. Yeah. You know, as we're standing, really, L.A. is the second hardest hit city from this pandemic, COVID, in America statistically. And it leads the worst of all the nation stacks when it comes to corruption, homelessness, incarceration, uh, child welfare. It leads and the city's now opening up. And for you guys to stand with this moment, to invest in this moment, and I want to encourage you to go and be a part of this moment. The crazy thing is, is we launched a vision in COVID, and 70% of it God's already done. There's already 500 churches in Los Angeles that have said, yeah, I just met with, and this is online, but I just met with the auxiliary bishop of the Catholic Church yesterday in L.A., and he's, they're going to mobilize thousands of people from the Catholic Church to unite with the evangelical church, to unite with the Jewish Federation, to unite with all different streams and races and faces. You guys might not know this, but there's already been 47 million in medical debt eradicated for 23,000. Like, we're not talking about it anymore. You guys were a part of it. Uh, we launched a foster initiative because the Board of Supervisors in L.A. County said we need the church to help. And it's our desire to not just make the church irresistible to the county, but irreplaceable. And in just a few months, hundreds of churches have launched this foster initiative. We already have over 1,300 families that have signed up to foster and adopt. We filmed 64 kids. Their stories have never been told in LA's history. 700 kids right now, legal orphans in LA, that want to be adopted. There's 7,000 that could be adopted, but only 700 are going to risk rejection again. We filmed their stories, and to hear them say why they want a mom and want a dad and what's so valuable, this is what you've been a part of. There's a message right now of hope. Uh, in every prison in the state of California since Easter, 35 prisons, an average of 3,500 inmates. Are you kidding me, people? This is what you guys are a part of. A... And now all that's left is for you to show up and go. And there's uh, information tables out there for One Day LA. And I would encourage you, this city's ready. And as your pastor said, it is not about one church. It is about the church. And as the nation's been dividing, what would it look like for the church to be uniting, setting aside our logos, our labels, and our egos, uniting with one voice as one family and one body to make Jesus famous, 
So you guys are invited. You guys are invited. That's, I'm going to run out of time if I keep talking about it, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And I give my love. Uh, my wife sends her love, Amber, and our four beautiful babies. You guys need to know you are so special and sacred to us. And I am not traveling to speak anywhere in the world right now. It's like everything's a no. This is the one place I'm like, but it's family. I was like, I got to go. So thank you, guys. We love you guys. You guys ready for the word tonight? We'll get comfortable. We'll get comfortable if you're online. And I think for me, the context of our conversation uh, would really be from the framework of a lot's changed since the last time we met. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is that an understatement? I'm like, I have another baby. There's no, 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 a few things else have happened. And would you agree that there's been a, a few things that have changed? in our culture, in our society, in our routines, if we're just to be honest, and I know we've talked about it a lot, but the reality is, is scientists right now are saying it's going to be five years to 10 years for many of us in this generation to recover from the mental stress of what we endured, whether you've stopped to process the pain or the trauma, it's there. And I think if we're to be honest, and you actually don't have to be the most intelligent individual in the room tonight, I think if we're to be honest, everything that could be shaken, has been shaken. Would you agree? Like every, eh, everything, if you're watching online, maybe you're not here tonight because you're not comfortable coming back in the room yet. Like I, just the way we do church has been shaken. I mean, our routines have been shaken. Our relationships, how weird did last year get, right? Let's just be real, okay? This is, that's what I do. Like, let's just talk normal. Like, it got, it got weird, Family conversations got weird. Friends that we grew up with, we know we're no longer talked to, whether we voted a certain way or didn't post the right thing or were pro-vaccination or anti-vaccination or opened early or wore a mask. Like, think about how quickly we lost friends and loved ones and how there's been a disconnect. I mean, just even traveling, I got to tell you, I'm not fond of traveling anymore, but to sit in a silver tube for hours with a mask on because it's going to protect us. You know, I'm just, it sounds crazy. You know, like it's recycled air in the tube, guys. Like, I think it's, I think that's like the death trap if you're thinking about this virus, but like we're flying everywhere and you got to wear masks the whole time. And then they're making infants wear masks and two-year-olds wear, you're like, come on, homie. Like, this is extreme uh, for the kids, you know? I mean, just the way we travel or, or how we shop or grocery store, like everything that could be shaken, let's be honest, has been shaken. And if we're to take that narrative a little further, would you not also believe that this is probably not the last of the shaking? Like, I'm just going to be honest. No one's excited about it, but it's like, I don't think it's done. Like, there's going to be something else. There's going to be a new tension. There's going to be a new disaster. There's going to, you know, be a cyber attack. Like, obviously, you hear all the narratives of what's coming. I don't know what's going to come, but what I do know is that this is probably not the last time there's going to be a shaking a shaking of our values, or a, sh- a shaking of our understanding, or shaking of our routine, a shaking of our comfort, a shaking of the things that we think will save us, or help us, or heal us. There's going to be a shaking, which means right now, here's what I want you to know. What we build on and what we build with matters. Like I- if I gotta be honest, right now more than ever, like regardless of what you believe, regardless if you've ever been in a, in a worship experience like this before, if you're watching online, you, I think we could just be real to say what we actually build our lives on and what we build our lives with matters more than ever. You know, as we look at our primary text tonight, which is in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, you know, Paul, who's authoring this letter to the church in Corinth, he, he opens, and many of you know 1 Corinthians 13, it's this love chapter, right? It's like the epic love chapter, and Paul opens up with like, hey, you could do everything, but if you don't have love, it's going to suck. Like, that's actually what he says. Do your own biblical due diligence. That was Jedediah's translation, not, you know, available out yet, but it's just there. And then, he, and then he goes on and just starts talking about, listen, not God's, not our love, but God's love. So don't put this on a Valentine's Day card. Don't tattoo this on your body, husband. This is like God's love, the love that's patient, the love that's kind, the love that keeps no record of wrong. That's none of us, right? The, the love that doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it never walks away, it never gives up, it never fails. He, he begins through this, goes through this beautiful chapter on love, and then he has this pause, and I'm just doing some due diligence for you, he has this pause, and he, he actually starts saying these words. He, he says, you know, the reality is, and this is what I want you to get here, the reality is, when we think about the future, 
When we think about human understanding, he actually says these words, we kind of only know in part. He's like, we kind of only know in part. And then he actually says, that's our logical thinking. Then even take it to the spiritual thinking. He says the things we would proclaim or the things that, you know, believers would use the words that we prophesy, that we actually feel the spirit leading us to say. He said, even our spiritual understanding is in part. There's no way we know it all or can figure it, out, figure it all out or understand it all. And I just want to let you know, friend, no matter what group you're a part of or what Facebook community or, you know, what survival elitist group or, you know, the conspiracy theory or whatever group you're a part of that thinks they know what's happening, they don't. Like, we know what's going to come next. No, we don't. We know what the government's going to do next. No, we don't. We know, we know what the president's going to do next. No, no, we, don't. we know who's going to attack us next. No, we know how this is going to No, we don't know what's going to come. And he says these words, he goes, we only can know in part. And then he ends, this is where I'm going to take us. He ends in verse 13, and I want you to hear these words. He says, these three things will last forever. So here's the, the reference. We don't know what's going to come. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Even when we tap into the spirit, we're only going to know in parts. We're only going to know in pieces. We're only going to know a puzzle of the big picture, but maybe never know the big picture. He says, we're never going to know exactly how this is going to play out, but... These three things will last forever. What is he saying? He says, these three things are eternal. These three, these three things will never fade away. These three things will never fail. These three things will never erode, will never, will never be wiped away. These three things are the eternal things that overshadow the temporal things. The things that last forever is faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, which means, friend, if we want to build a life that will last, if we want to build a life that's unshakable, no matter what's going to come our way, no matter what we're going to face, no matter what type of opposition, no matter what type of pandemic, no matter what the future holds, no matter if the bubble bursts and there's an economic downturn, no matter what's to come, if you want to build a family that lasts, a church that lasts, a business that lasts, a ministry that lasts, no matter what comes your way, he says these three things will never go away. It's faith, hope, and love. And this is why it's so significant that I talk about this to you tonight. This is why it's so significant, because I could tell you about future storms. Yeah. I could talk about the storms and the type of storms and the length of storms and, and what you do when you're in the storm, right? Like there's a lot of people talking about future storms. We could talk about all the types of disasters that could happen, all the types of tension that could happen in our nation. We could continue to focus on what's to come, or we can just build with materials that will last no matter what the storm is. We can build with the very thing that cannot, will not be shaken. I want to talk to you about the three things that if you build with, you will be unshakable. It's faith. It's hope. I'm going to encourage you, and if you're just checking this out, like this is what us crazy Christians believe, go ahead and test it. Just start building your life on faith, hope, and love, and see how it works out for you. These things will last forever. These three, three things are the... The, the, the eternal that's overshadowing the temporal. These three things are faith, hope, and love. Say that with me. Faith, hope, and love. The first is faith. Can I talk to you about faith for a moment? They gave me a few minutes, so I get to talk. I got the mic. It's gonna, what's happening here? Can I talk about faith for a moment? Here's what you need to know, and I would take notes if you could or just watch this later and you know, put it on a few speeds slow so I'm talking like this when you actually hear it. Faith. Faith is the currency of heaven. I want you to understand this because faith is something for many of us is just thrown out there and I have faith and this is faith, but it's like this elusive thing we can't get a hold of. I want your mind to get a picture of what faith actually looks like in your life. Faith is the currency of heaven and honor is the platform on which faith is exchanged. Let me unpack that for you. See, see, faith is God's purchasing power. Faith is God's backing capital. Faith, faith is the currency in which transactions are made. It's like we have a dollar for our currency. And if you use this currency, you can transact in our culture. If you come in with a different currency, guess what? You have to change your currency to our currency to actually purchase. So you, you and your human body have a certain currency, and then you get adopted into God's family, and now you access a brand new bank account. And and that currency is called faith, but without honor, faith is irrelevant because there's no exchange of currency. 
let, let me unpack this. And many of you that are, are believers have done this for a while. You're already, you're already thinking where I'm going. Think about Jesus showing up, fully God and fully man, in his hometown. And it actually says, hey, they're all like, hey, isn't this Joseph boy? Isn't this a carpenter kid? And the Bible says Jesus was without honor, so he could only do a few things. Now, God had the ability to do all things, but he couldn't use the currency because there was no platform of honor for it to be exchanged. Faith, as Hebrews 11 says, is the substance of things hoped for. Now, that word substance actually means substructure. It actually means firm foundation. Faith is not elusive. Faith is not ethereal. Faith is just not spiritual. Faith is real. Faith is something that's just as real as this platform that I'm standing on. And the reality is, is we tell people we have faith for something, but what's really happening is you have faith from something. We like to say I have faith for my family or faith for my finances or faith for the future, but your faith for is connected to really your faith from. Because I have faith from the cross. I have faith from a conquered grave. I have faith because of his mercy. I have faith because his spirit's living inside of me. Because he's already done something, I now have faith for something because my faith for something is connected to my faith from something. Faith, I love faith. Sorry, I'm excited about this. Faith, faith is your business partner. Oh, I want you to get this. Faith is, imagine you have a business partner in every room, in every realm, in every neighborhood, in every conversation, in every student board, in every HR meeting. You have a business partner with you called faith. It's actually your, your, your backing capital to build God's kingdom. Now, in my old life, I used to sell high residential real estate, and there's certain clients that I had that were extremely high net worth that I worked with the client for a little bit, but then when it went to the contract, I worked with a purchasing agent or a money manager, and I remember sometimes, like, it would be a 31-year-old, very young, ignorant, arrogant, but when he talked to me, it was as if he was the billionaire. You know, I remember representing a billionaire, I was talking to his representative, and, like, he was calling all the shots, and I was like, hey, don't we need to talk to the big guy? Like, don't we need to, like, he's got the money. Like, are you sure you can do this? But he had already been backed by this billionaire and been empowered to make purchases and acquisitions. And this was his business partner. So although he was 31 and wasn't a billionaire, he was backed by one. Can I just tell you something? Whether you're 12 years old or 20 year old or 90 year old, no matter if you're a teacher, a stay at home mom, an entrepreneur, a first responder, that every room and realm you walk into, you actually have a business partner which allows you to say, no, 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 we're going to write the check. No, 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 we're going to start another campus. No, 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 that marriage is going to be restored. No, 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 my son and daughter, they're going to not be addicted anymore. No, my uncle is going to come home. Why? Because I got a business partner that's backing all of my purchases. And you, the level of your faith always determines the level of your breakthrough. Another way that I put it is God always feeds you according to the level of your faith. God feeds you according to the level of your faith. And let me unpack this. Let me, let's go to Joshua real quick. I just want to unpack this. And, Chapter 5, verse 12, this is a story you guys have heard communicated often, and this is this journey we're picking up is on God's people, the Israelites, who have spent 400 years in oppression and then 40 years in the wilderness. Some of you have heard this story before. They're wandering and roaming in the wilderness, and God's providing you know, this manna every day for them to eat from. That's all they eat for 40 years. Like, I might like spaghetti, but not every night. <laughs> and this wasn't even spaghetti. There's no sauce on this manna. It was planned. It was gluten-free. This is where it all started. It's where the curse started. Gluten-free manna. <laughs> They're like, is that vegan? It's like, shut up. It's manna. That's what you get to eat. 40, 40. You can tell I'm comfortable. Who says that in church? I just did. It's 40. <laughs> Moms are taking the kids. We're never coming back. It's 40 years. 40 years in the wilderness eating the same thing. Eating the same thing. Eating the same thing. Always eating the same thing. Always having the same thing. Always having just enough for the day. Just enough for that moment. Not, not an abundance, not a surplus, just enough. And then they cross over the Jordan, many of you know this, into what God would call the promised land. We identify this as the place of promise. And I always thought that when they crossed over the Jordan, that that was the moment God just said, I'm done with the manna. Like, hey, you're now in promise. I'm going to stop the manna. And because I stopped the manna, you're going to go find food. 
But that's not what the scripture says. Look at what it says in verse 12. It says, no manna appeared on the day they first ate from the crops of the land. It doesn't say the manna stopped, then they ate. It says, no manna appeared on the day they first ate from the crops of the land, and it was never seen again. So from that time on, the Israelites ate from the crops of Canaan. They shifted their appetite, and God stopped providing them manna because they elevated their faith for something more. I I just want to tell you something. They could have just waited for manna. But the moment they stepped in promise, the level of their faith changed. Their appetite changed. They went from wandering to owning to occupying to possessing. And all of a sudden, they go, wait a second. I don't just want manna. I want to eat from the fruit of the land. And I just want to encourage you. It's time for us to shift our appetite because some of us are just saying, I just need enough. I just need to get through. I just need to survive. And guess what? God will always meet you according to the level of your faith. I don't know many people, and Pastor Sean and Diana can correct me. I don't know many people in my journey with Jesus that literally go, hey, I believe for this. And then God did a hundred million X more. And that's not what I've ever heard. I've never heard like, hey, I believe for one campus. And a year later, there's 152. No. You know why you got to this campus? It's not because the crowd got bigger at the community center. It's because the faith of the church got bigger to say we want to take more ground and take more territory. But if you actually limit what you're believing for, you're limiting what God can provide, which means we have to go, wait a second. I don't want just enough. I don't want to just get by. I just don't, I don't want to just get healed. I mean, I had people praying for one person's healing. It's like, that's great. But what about everyone's healing? Like if your prayers got answered, what changes? Your world or the world? What happens if everything you cried out for happened? What would change? Your world or the world? And then because I got time, I'm going to take it's not even in the message. It's just just a little extra for this church for tonight. I want you to see what also happened. When they changed their faith, they actually skipped seasons. See, the Bible tells us in Genesis, it says, hey, there's, there's, there's going to be a few things that will remain. And one of them is the cycle of seasons, and God identifies it as seed, time, and harvest. Have you heard this before? He says, as long as there's the the sun and the moon, as long as there's the earth, as long as there's time, there's always going to be seed, time, and harvest. It is a sequence of seasons. you got to plant the seed. you got to wait and endure the time, and then you move to the harvest. But when they moved over and shifted their faith, they didn't plant any seed. They didn't water anything. They didn't wait for anything. I hope you can get this. They skipped, skipped the seed season. They skipped the time season, and they moved right to harvest. If you want to know where God's taken Fellowship Church, if you want to know where God's taken your family, if you want to know where God's taken the church and this new era in time, he's taken the church to skipping of seasons. You think you're going to have to find the seed. You think you're going to have to endure the time, but he's skipping us right Okay, can I go a little deeper? This is just for you. This is just for you. Here's the point. God wastes nothing. I want to let, you, let this hit your spirit, hit your soul, offend your mind. God wastes nothing, which means God doesn't waste the pandemic. God wastes nothing. And, and as I'm reading this verse, I'll never forget. I was like, God, I, I mean, I, I kind of hear you, but I don't know if I believe you. I'm just being honest. And he goes, what do you mean? I was like, well, there's 400 years in slavery. 40 years in the wilderness, like, what do you mean you waste nothing? There's a lot of time. And then he, he reminds me, he goes, hey, hey, hey Jedediah, um, when the Israelites crossed over into the promised land, did they ever build anything? No, it's not your question. No. Did, he, did they dig a well? No. Did they create economy? No. When they crossed over into the promised land, did they build industry? No. Did they create a school system? Did they create commerce? No, the Bible tells us that in five years, they, uh, they took over 31 kingdoms. The Bible tells us that in five years, they conquered and took over the possessions, the industry, the economy, the access of 31 kingdoms. And here's what God says. I waste nothing 
He goes, could it be, Jedediah, that every time the Israelites 400 years ago, this is about to get good, I know where I'm going. Isn't it so great that the Israelites 400 years ago, every time they placed a brick and burden, burden, could I have the world preparing for them a brick and blessing? Every time they were digging in oppression, every time they're building a well in oppression, every time they're building a school in oppression, every time they owned nothing, had nothing, and were building in bondage, could God have the world prepare for them a brick and blessing so that when they finally caught up and started skipping seasons, they built nothing, bought nothing, developed nothing, they just skipped seasons and took over. Can I just tell you something to this church? There's some things that will not make sense because it's completely out of season because you wait, we need more money or we need more volunteers or we need more infrastructure and God say, no, no, no. There's churches that wanted to plant here that died here and while they were placing bricks in burden, God was preparing for this house bricks in blessing. Come on, if you believe it. Just take it up all my time on that point. It's time to change our appetite. Faith, hope, and love. If you build with these things, you'll be unshakable. Your family, your marriage, your church. It's faith, it's hope, and it's love. The second unshakable component that we can build our lives with is hope. Now, I need you to get this. If you do not have faith, you will not have hope. So say anyone who's hopeless is faithless. Because the Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the substructure. It's the foundation, which is why faith, the Bible says, it's now. I don't need faith for tomorrow. I need faith for today. But because I have faith for today, I have hope for tomorrow. But if I lose my faith, lose my belief, lose this tangible thing called the cross that I'm standing on, then I'll lose the ability to have any hope for the future. As I looked at the year of changes that we've been through, I feel like I asked myself the question so many times, where did the people of hope go? I got to be honest, I think hope is one of the most underrated attributes of the life of a believer. Our hope should be contagious. Our hope should be overwhelming. Our, our hope should be irresistible. We should have so much faith that inevitably we will have so much hope. And as I looked at social media posts and I look at Facebook chats and I, and I looked at the narrative being released from those that call themselves followers of Christ, I sat there and said, where has all the hope gone? And we don't even know the power. I'm telling you, we don't even know the power of simply hope. There's a, a scientist, his name is Kirk Ritter, in the 1950s. Uh, he was a Harvard grad and a John Hopkins scientist. And he, for some reason, as scientists often do, try to figure out things no one's asking about. But he's like, I want to know the average life expectancy of a rat swimming in a bucket of recycled water. Ask no one ever. You know, it's like, <laughs> no one said, I wonder. No, we're like, kill the rats. As soon as they're like, I'll help them drown. They don't need, they're not mice. These aren't hamsters. Don't fill for them. These are vicious, horrid rats. Okay, no one likes a rat. If you do, we have a moment for you at the end of service. We'll talk, there's a booth outside. One day I lay. No one wants to know how these rats live. Okay, I gotta get through this mess. I'm getting in trouble. So, so he's, he starts testing this. He's like, let's see how long a rat will live. And he quickly realizes that the average life expectancy of all rats, any rat, swimming in a bucket of recycled water is 15 minutes. Tell your neighbor 15 minutes. 15, one, five. 15 minutes is the average life expectancy. Every rat on average is kind of killing over at the 15 minute mark. He continues his study. And this next phase of the study is he stops the rat that's about to drown right at the 14 and a half minute mark, he pulls the rat out, dries the rat off, rests it for minutes, and then puts it back in the bucket of water. Do you know how long the rat that got put out of the water that gets put back in swims for on average? So every rat, just to do the math in case you're following, every rat would die at the 15 minute mark. But this would be rats that they'd pull out right before they would die, dry them off for minutes, not for days, put them back in the bucket. Do you know how long this rat would now swim a second time? 30 minutes, great guess. Two hours, this guy's crazy. <laughs> How long? Two minutes? How long? Five minutes? 
See, I said he was crazy, and then everyone went lower. They're like, 30 seconds. <laughs> he didn't swim. He died immediately. He's like, no. First rat, every rat, on average, added the 15-minute mark. But every rat that was rescued, pulled out, put back in, would swim on average the second time 60 hours. 60 hours. 240 times longer than every single rat that died at the 15-minute mark. You know what science concluded? You know what the logical conclusion of the brains of humanity were in the form of science? The only difference between the rat that drowned at the 15-minute mark and the rat that would swim 60 hours, 240 times longer, was this rat had a reference point for being rescued. The only difference... The only difference for this rat at all was that it had been rescued before, so it would just keep on swimming a supernatural amount because it had a reference point of being rescued. Can I just tell you something, friend? As believers, we should love more, run harder, swim longer, outlast everyone with an endless, relentless hope because as the Bible says, it is God that has saved us from the deadly peril and on him we set our hope because he will surely rescue us again. And the reason why we keep swimming is for us, our hope is not in a program. Our hope is not in a 401k. Our hope is not in a policy or, or a political program or a buyout. Our hope is not in a stimulus check. Are you hearing me? Our hope is not in a relationship. Our hope is not in a platform. Our hope is not in a possession. Our hope is not in a position. Our hope is different than the world's hope because our hope was born in a manger and baptized in a Jordan. Our hope endured the cross and conquered sin, death, and the grave. Our hope is the reigning, undefeated champion of humanity who has no equal, who has no rival. Our hope has a name. Our hope is alive. And our hope's name is Jesus. It's Jesus. And on him, we better sound and look different than everyone because we've been rescued. Not that we will be rescued. Are you kidding me? This moment, this mist, this vapor, this little trial, whatever it is, this is a second. And then our, our eternal fate has been settled. We have been rescued. And when you forget it, friend, the world will never see it because our hope is in Jesus, but the hope of the world is Jesus in us. I'm gonna say it again. Our hope is in Jesus, but the hope of the world is Jesus in us. Faith, hope. I gotta go, I gotta go. Faith, faith, hope, and love. Come and say it with me, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope. The last one is love. You want to build a life that's going to be unshakable. You want a marriage, a ministry, a business, a community that's unshakable. It's going to be built on faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And as we started tonight with communion, which is where we're going to end, it's this moment of this, this last supper as Jesus has gathered his, his 12 homies, ones that are full of pride, ones that are going to betray him, ones that have misjudged him, ones that misunderstood him, and he's got him into this intimate place, and he's only got a few words left as fully God and fully man, and he, he looks at them and he says, listen, there's a new command I give to you. It's Jesus' words, breaking the bread, passing the cup. He looks at him and says, hey, listen, there's a new command I give to you. Love one another. Right. We're all like, Really? Her? Him? They? Mother-in-law? If you're watching, Mom, I love you, mother-in-law. I love you. <laughs> he says, I want you to love. It's a new command. I'm simplifying it. Let's just get to one thing. There's all these commandments from the Old Testament. Let's just make it really simple. New command I give to you. Love one another. If we're being honest, we're like, yeah. They voted different, though. 
There are vaccinators. There are crazy non-vaccinators. Like whatever it is for you, right? He says, he says love one another. And then, he, and then it gets worse. I'm just be honest. It gets worse before it gets better. He goes, I want you to love one another. And we're like, okay, I'll try to figure it out. And then he goes, as, as I have loved you. What? Like loving my way is hard enough. <laughs> loving the way I want to love others is hard enough. Like, I'll do my version of love. I'll do my version of putting my best face on. I'll do my version of acting like it doesn't bother me or my version of acting like that comment's not insensitive. I'll do my version. And Jesus says, I need you to love one another as I have loved you. And then he says these words, by this. By what? Everyone will know. (sighs) What is our primary mechanism of evangelism? Get this. How's everyone going to know? It's not just because we do stadium events. It's not just because we have 22 Easter services. He's like, you want to know? I'm giving you guys a secret to telling the world about Jesus. It's not a track system. It's not like the million dollar thing and you open it up and there's a Bible verse. It's not the, hey, you're going to hell or heaven. You know, it's, <laughs> you're going to burn, brother. What are you going to do? Well, you might make it to heaven, but you can smell like smoke. I mean, he says, you want to let every, you want, you want to get the word out. You want to give people a message of hope and healing, healing from their yesterdays, hope for their tomorrows. You want to do that? Yeah, it's super simple. It's not about texting everyone or just inviting everyone. You want to know where it starts? Just loving everyone the way that I have loved you. It's time, can I just tell you, it's time for us to be known for love again. It's time for the church to be known for love again. If we're to be very honest, we do not have the best reputation right now. And some of our actions, some of our statements, some of us not just living up to this one verse is the reason why we're in the predicament that we are. If you were to ask an atheist or an agnostic on an airplane or in an Uber, hey, when you hear the word Christ church or Christian, what do you think of? They would not say, those are the people who love. That is not our witness. And I feel as God saying, you want, listen, the church got shaken, but you know what would last? Love. You know what's always going to be there? Love. You know what's always going to work? Love. You know how we heal our cities? Love. You know how we build bridges instead of tear down roads? Love. Which is why when the world hates, we love. And when the world hits, we love. And when the world hurts, us, these guys, us in this room, we love. And when the world fails, we love. And then when the world gets mean, we love. And when the world doesn't love us back, we love. Because we don't love the world because the world loves us. We love the world because God loves us. And our God loves, so loves the world. It's time. It's time for the church to be rebranded as the vehicle that loves. It's time for Christians to be known for. You know what? The, you know what our goal is with love has no limits. You guys have heard this. Our goal is that a decade from now, because of what starts in a month and a half and moves across America and continues around the world, our job, our goal, our dream is that a decade from now, when an atheist or agnostic or someone who's just completely anti-Christ hears the words Christ, Church, or Christian that their logical conclusion would be, you know what? Those are the guys who love no matter what. Those are the guys who stood with me no matter what. These are the guys that believed in me no matter what. And for some of us, it's easier to love the world than it is to love one another. It's time for us to be known for love again. I can tell you one thing. This is probably not the last thing we're going to face as a church as a country, as a nation, or as the globe. But if you want to know how we're going to build an unshakable life, it's faith, hope, and love. You want to know how we're going to conquer this year? You want to know how your families are going to get restored? You want to know how you're going to overcome in your business? Faith, hope. 
You don't want to know how you're going to change Antioch, change the surrounding areas of NorCal? Faith, hope, and love. What's the future look like? Faith, hope, and love. What's the church supposed to be known for? Faith, hope, and love. How are we going to be unshakable? Faith, hope. Come on, if you believe it, give them a shout of praise tonight. All right, I'm about, I'm about to close. We're going to turn it to your normal program. You want to know what's amazing? Your pastors preach a message. Don't remember exactly what the month was. He was uh, rebuild and recover. Is that it? Rebuild and recover? Rebuild and recover? What were you rebuilding? The wall. Do you remember? You weren't here. He's talking about the wall that Nehemiah rebuilt supernaturally in literally less than 60 days. You know what I'm talking about? Isn't it interesting? It said it's time to rebuild. It's time to recover. And you know what we're going to rebuild with? We're going to build on the cornerstone called Christ with the components called faith, hope, and love. Here's what I want you to know. Your orders have been made clear. And now God's bringing you the materials so that you can build with faith, hope. You know, as we close, and, and Pastor Sean's going to come up and make sense of all this mess, I, I just want to pray quickly uh, for just really one group of people tonight, and, and I really feel this on my heart, this hopeless thing. Like, when I, when I got to that hopeless part, it just hits you so hard, because sometimes you don't realize that hope's gone. You just feel different. You look different. You talk different, and you've been trying to muster up the Christian language when you roll in here. Let's just be honest. How, how you doing? Better than ever, brother. How you doing? In my word every day, praying. I didn't ask you about your quiet time, right? You're like, how's things going at home? It's great. Shut up. You know? Get over here. How, how's everything? Like, let's just be honest for a second. You might be watching right now at home. You might be in the room, and you do not resonate with the word hope. To you, it feels like it's gone. It feels like you've been trying to fake it, but none of it feels real. You feel like you've lost hope. Maybe it's hope that a loved one would come back. Maybe it's hope that your marriage would be restored. Maybe it's the hope that God could ever use you or God could ever heal you or God could ever restore you. Maybe it's the hope that I just never, I don't even have hope that I'm going to get out of this debt. I don't get hope that it's, my life's ever going to look normal again. You've lost hope. If that's you, and we have no desire to embarrass you here at Fellowship Church, but if that's you, would you just kindly raise your hand right now where you're at? You feel like you've lost hope. You feel like you've lost hope. I see that hand. Come on, don't be embarrassed. I know eyes are open. This is a great moment. These hands over here, unbelievable. Who else just quickly see these hands, see these hands. Thank you. So many hands going up. See these hands. See these hands. Just take them. Just, just, if that's you, just keep your hand. You know, there's so many people in this room. Guess what? This is the place to be honest and be transparent. This is your safe place. Like, this is the group of people that believe in you. Come on, if that is you and you feel like you've lost hope, would you just raise your hand? I just want to pray quickly in this moment. I can just tell you what I see before I release this prayer. I see wind coming back to yourselves. Because wind you cannot fabricate. When you're out on the ocean, you either have sails and God provides wind or you just don't go anywhere. And I see you, all you have to do is start putting the cell back up. Hear me. Your cell's been down. I know I'm talking to a few people in the room. Your cell's been down. It's like, God, if I put it up, are you going to blow again? Are you going to move again? Are you going to come again? And I just feel God saying, it's time to hoist the cell again. It's time to open up the cell again. It's time to create some protection again because that I see a wind of hope blowing into your home. I see a wind of hope blowing into that marriage. I see a wind of hope blowing into that abusive situation, that addictive situation. I see a wind of hope. Your perspective for your future, your children, your children's children, your children's children. I see hope coming back. So Father God, right now, God, right now we release supernatural hope that's anchored into what you've already done for us. 
God, and even as I release hope, I just, I don't want to limit what God can do in this moment. God, for those who need miracles right now, those that lost hope in the healing, I'm always going to have these migraines. I'm always going to have this herniated disc. I'm always going to walk with a limp. I'm always going to have that stigma in my eye. I'm always going to have less hearing in my right ear. There's just hope that you're not going to be hopeless, that you're not going to be healed. We rebuke that right now in Jesus' name. And even the things that look like they're so far gone and so far off right now, Jesus, we release our faith for an absolute miracle. In Jesus. God, I thank you, Lord, that peace, grace, mercy is coming to every heart, is coming to every home, everyone watching and everyone in this room. And God, as we leave here building our lives on you, May we constantly, daily, build with faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. In your name we pray. Amen and amen.